Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great grace and your mercy and your love, Lord, that your arm is not short to reach to us, Lord, but you are long-suffering and gentle in mercy and short to anger. Lord, we thank you, for we need you, Lord. We need your grace in this time. Lord, we lift up those who are still without power, and Lord, you would be working with them and working with the, the men who are out there working and women who are working, Lord, tirelessly to salvage the uh, connections and all that to the power. And we just pray your grace and mercy upon us, upon this whole community, Lord. And Lord, that people would cry out to you, O oh God, and not just be angry at the circumstance, but cry out to you for help. And Lord, we do thank you for your help in us, for your mercy and grace that has come through the blood of Jesus Christ that has washed us and cleansed us and set us free. And we thank you that we have a joy to live, a joy to love you in Jesus' name. saved us. We didn't save ourselves, and we are so grateful, Lord, that you made a way for us, that you called us, that you loved us. We bless your name. Jesus, you are Lord of all. Jesus, lover of my soul, Jesus, I will never let you go. Taking me from the miry clay, set my feet upon the rock, and now I know I love you. I need you. Though my world may fall, I'll never let you go. My Savior, my close. 
worship friend I will worship you till the very end Jesus lover of my soul Jesus I will never let you go you've taken me from the miry clay Set my feet upon the rock Now I know I love you I need you Though my world may fall I'll never let you go My Savior My closest friend I will worship you Till the very Lover of my soul, Jesus, I will never let you go. You've taken me from the miry clay, set my feet upon the rock. Now I know. I'll never let you go, my Savior, my closest friend. I will worship you till the very end. I love you. I need you. Though my world may fall, I'll never let you go. I will worship you till the very end. Jesus, lover of my soul. I will never let you go. Father, this morning we thank you that we can rest in you. We thank you, God, that we can have your peace and your joy. And Father, we acknowledge that this morning, Lord. And we do acknowledge our need for you, God, in every area of our heart, in every area of our mind, in every area of our life, we need you, God. And Father, we are simple people, Lord. So we pray that you would simply speak to us, Lord, to our hearts today. And Father, make us to hear what you would have us to know. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> We're glad you're here this morning. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 26 today. Acts 26. <clears throat> Okay, look at me. I want to read a scripture to you before we go into the book of Acts. It's in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16, and it says this. Thus says the Lord, <clears throat> Stand in the ways and see... And as for the old path, 
where the good way is and walk in it. And then you will find rest for your soul. But they said, we will not walk in it. <clears throat> Let me give you a little bit of background. God has spoken to his people. He tells them that judgment is coming. He said, I'm going to bring down Nebuchadnezzar and I'm going to captivate you unless you begin to walk in the ways that you used to walk, the old path. And they said to God, <clears throat> no, we're not going to walk in the ways that we used to walk. We're not going to walk in that path. And so what happened to them is this. History tells us Nebuchadnezzar came down and captivated them, took them captive. Matter of fact, he went down three times and destroyed them because they wouldn't walk in the old way. I believe, because the Bible teaches, that the world is headed for judgment. God calls it the Great Tribulation. You can read it in the book of Revelation, chapter 6 through 19. And I believe as a nation we are given the opportunity to be able to walk in the ways of the old times or the old path. I don't believe that we can deter the judgment of God. But I do believe <clears throat> that it is God's desire that we walk in the old path. What is the old path? It is walking in the obedience to the word of God that God teaches us. There are many today in the church who are influenced by society and culture. The Bible teaches that God wants us to be influenced by him. I cannot emphasize enough this morning to you and to my own personal self and my own relationship with God how important that I walk in the old ways, the old path. It's not hard to know what that path is. It's the Word of God doing the will of God. As I read the scripture, it teaches me exactly how God wants me to walk. And that's between me and God, me and God and God alone. But that's God's desire. The church is changing. And it's changing not for the good. And God wants us to walk in the old way. Some people say, no, that's the old way. That's the, I don't want to do that. That's how my parents do. I don't know if you watch the, the commercials. There's one on there specifically. It's by Progressive Insurance. It's an old guy, and he's teaching all these young people how not to walk like their parents walk, not to talk like their parents, not to think like their parents. And it's total common sense. But they don't want you and they want to infiltrate your mind of the old way is not the good way. America has been founded on Christianity. That's the old way. That's God's way. So I, I can't emphasize it enough this morning that we walk according to the scripture, according to the word of God. Let's go back to the scripture now, our text. Paul has been arrested. <clears throat> he has stood before the Festus, the governor, and he's been asked if he'd go back to Jerusalem to be tried. For sure death would await him by the religious leaders. He answers no, and he appeals to Caesar. 
He'll stand before Caesar himself, he says. A Roman citizen could do this. While he's waiting to go to Rome, King Agrippa and Bernice come to Caesarea, where Paul is being held as a prisoner. Festus discusses Paul with Agrippa, and he tells him he has nothing to really write about concerning Paul. So he's hoping King Agrippa can help. So the next day, Paul stands before Festus and King Agrippa, and Bernice, Agrippa's wife. Verse 1 we start on, it says, Then Agrippa said to Paul, You are permitted to speak for yourself. So Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself. So, here Paul stands. He's in the will of God. He's doing the work of God. He's arrested. Stands before a certain man named Agrippa. And I believe Paul knows this history because Paul was well known in the sense of his knowledge and his wisdom and counsel concerning history. He's standing before the man whose great-grandfather had tried to kill Jesus as a baby. His grandfather had John the Baptist beheaded. His father had martyred for the first apostle, James. Agrippa's family's history is unlikely to receive Paul. <clears throat> But, though all those things are true, Paul's life is in the hand of the Lord, not in the ruler's hand. Let me share this for a second. If you were to look at Paul's life and you know the history of what was going on with Paul, you would say without a doubt, God has his hand on Paul. Paul has nothing to worry about. But when we look at our own personal life, sometimes we think the opposite. We think everything is showering down on us, so to say, and everything's a mess. Where are you, God? Paul doesn't see it this way, and you shouldn't see it this way as a Christian. If you've been walking with the Lord for a period of time, you should know that God is faithful to the Word of God and faithful to you as a child of God. We're going to see a lot of different things happen. This snow, it hasn't snowed like this that I think of since 1973 in Clear Lake. And a lot of people were freaked out <clears throat> because they weren't ready for it. But God knows the snow was going to happen. God takes care of us. So like Paul, uh, let us be settled on the truth of what God says and the promises he's made to us. He goes on, and here's Paul's response. <clears throat> I think myself happy, verse 2 and 3, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things which I am accused by the Jews, especially because you are an expert on customs and questions which they have to do with Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. So Paul tells Agrippa, I'm very happy to be able to explain my case to you because I know you have the background of these things. So a King Agrippa knew the customs, knew about the prophets. He was part, partly Jewish, so he was well acquainted with what Paul is going to say. Verse 4, my manner of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among you, my own nation at Jerusalem, <clears throat> all the Jews know. They knew me from the first, if they were willing to testify that according to the strictest sect of religion, I lived as a Pharisee. So Paul is telling his history of his life, how he lived, what he did. He, as a youth, he, became a, he prepared for being a Pharisee. And according to the law, the strictest of the law, he did everything right. He was a Pharisee's Pharisees. He was a man who was sold out to religion. Okay, don't forget that part. Sold out to religion. Verse 6. And now I stand and I am judged for the purpose of the whole promise made by God to our fathers. So Paul is speaking of here of the hope of the Messiah, the Savior of the world, or the Savior of the people. In the book of Acts, 
It is spoken of the same thought. In 13.23, it says this, For this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a Savior, Jesus Christ. I want you to turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 13. With the same thought in mind, the promise, or the hope made to our fathers, talking about the Messiah. <clears throat> Verse 31, 13, 31. And it says this, And over a, penny, a period of many days, he appeared to those who had gone with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, talking about Jesus, and they are now his witnesses to the people of Israel. And now we are here to bring you this good news. The promise was made to all of our ancestors, and God has now fulfilled it for us, their descendants by raising Jesus. This is what the second psalm says about Jesus. You are my son. Today I have become your father. For God has promised to raise him from the dead, not leaving him to rot in the grave. He said, I will give you the sacred blessings I promised to David. Another psalm explains it more fully. You will not allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. This is not a reference to David. For after David had done the will of God in his own generation, he died and was buried with his ancestors, and his body decayed. <clears throat> no, it was a reference to someone else, someone who God raised, and his body did not decay. Brothers, listen. We are here to proclaim that through this man, Jesus, there is forgiveness for your sins. Everyone who believes in him is declared right before God, something the law of Moses could never do. Be careful. Don't let the prophet's words apply to you. For they said, Look, you mockers, be amazed and die. For I am doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't believe even if someone told you about it. Paul goes on in verse 7, and he says this, To this promise are twelve tribes earnestly serving God night and day, hope to attain. For this hope sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Sometimes when we read scripture, <clears throat> there are stories about men like Paul. We forget that they're human, that they have feelings and emotions, and that they love, and things do, do bother them. Things happen within their own hearts that affect their hearts. Paul must have been so sad concerning his own people, whom he loved. When he tries them to bring him the light of the Holy Scripture, and, this, and they reject it and refuse to receive it. And they even accuse him of being a false witness. How would you like to be sent by God? You do everything, well, you do everything that God tells you to do, and they reject you and refuse to hear what you say. Most of you know the prophet of Jeremiah. <clears throat> if you read the story, he was in ministry for like 60 years. And he gave prophecy after prophecy, and God used him in a mighty way. But he came to one point, and he said, God, I'm not going to do this anymore. The people won't listen, God. He never had one convert. After 60 years of ministry, they say, they refused to listen. But he continued to do what God told him to do. And Paul is probably feeling the same way. Now, sometimes people don't want to hear the truth unless it goes along with what they already believe. Because they don't want their boat rocked. Sometimes we all need to have our boats rocked because we don't realize that there are some leaks in the deck and it begins to fill up with water, and it's about to sink. 
So it needs to be rocked so we can see that there are some holes that need to be plugged by the word of God. Amen? Beloved, these men, religious leaders and Roman leaders, would end up not listening, and they would end up drowning, but they would also bring a lot of others in their boat to drown along with them. Now, it could be just that they didn't want change are we willing to change? As a Christian, we must be open to change. We must be, real, be willing to allow the Word of God to change me. Our prayer needs to be, Lord, what is it you want to change in me? Yes, Lord. In about three weeks, I'll be putting my little tomato plants in the ground. Can't wait. In about a week, they'll start to grow real fast. As they grow, they'll be changing every day. They'll get thicker, the vines bigger, their leaves will get larger, and some will even get some flowers on them. About a month and a half after I plant those plants, fruit will begin to come. If I keep them in their little pots, they get root-bound and they'll stop growing. This is similar to every Christian life. If I am against change, or if I fight against change, I'll stop my spiritual growth and I will also be resisting the potter and I'll stay a lump of clay. So, Question number one for you this morning. <clears throat> what is it that God wants to change in you? Please don't say to me this morning, God doesn't need to change anything in me. I'm right where he wants me to be. You might be exactly where God wants you to be, but God doesn't want you to stay there. And are you open to allow God to change maybe what you believe or how you talk or how you live or even how you think? <clears throat> I want to share this with you this morning. Sometimes people look at a pastor and they think, he's arrived. When I get to heaven and when you get to heaven, just like all of us will arrive and not until and God works in me this week it's like he does every week and every day he works in me but he worked in my thinking this week let me share with you real quickly hopefully it'll help you <clears throat> in the Old Testament there's a story about how God was going to send his people over to the promised land he sent 12 spies into the land and all of them came back. But 10 of them had one idea of thinking and their thinking was, we just can't do it. We just can't do it. There's giants in the land. There are high cities, high walls, you name it. We cannot do it. And they deterred all the people. And they scared all the people and put fear in the people. But they were thinking of two other men. Do you remember the story? Two other men came. You remember their names? Joshua and Caleb. They came back and what did they say? We can do it. God is for us and if God's for us, nothing can be against us. We'll totally succeed. God worked in my thinking this week because our, at times in all of our thinking, we think like the 10 spies that came back and said, it's too big, it's too big. Or we can think the right way that God wants us to think. And that's like Caleb and Joshua. Nothing's too big for God. So,
If God is trying today to work in any area of your heart, tell him, go ahead, Lord. Do as you please. I fully surrender myself over to you. Let this all be in our hearts. God changes, brings more blessings from him and freedom that God wants us to walk in. Now he goes on. <clears throat> Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? In the book of John, chapter 20, verse 27, it says this. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hand and reach your hand he here and put it in my side and do not be unbelieving, but believe. Paul, the apostle, I am certain, was praying and hoping that somehow, some way, he could convert King Agrippa to the faith in Jesus Christ. I'm sure that Paul was thinking if this guy would just get saved, being the king over the authority or the territory, what an influence he could be. And so he begins right away drawing Agrippa into saying, why should you think it is so incredible that God should raise the dead? Now, what do you think about the resurrection of Jesus? There's no doubt in my mind at all concerning Christ being raised from the dead because of Scripture. Most of the problems that people have with Scripture today are because of their concept of God. Their concept is too small. There is nothing too big for God, nothing he can't fix, any marriage. He can free any slave, and he can change any heart if he's allowed to do that. Please give me your attention for a second. Many times when we're younger in God, we believe that God is able and capable of doing anything there is nothing that God cannot do. And guess what happens? As we begin to act on that faith, it begins to happen in our life. God begins to change things that man says is impossible to do. From a person who is an alcoholic or a drug addict, God sets them free, and they're free of their new creations. But then as we get older in God, what happens to us is we don't feel like we need as much as we do when we're younger in God. We have a lot more problems. God fixed a lot of our problems. But we still have other areas which we don't realize that God wants to change. God doesn't say, okay, that's good enough. Let's stop there. Let's put you on hold for 10 years. God says, there's other things that I want to change. There's other things that are going to happen in your life that you're not going to know and not expect. And I want to fix those areas in your life and make sure you know I'm there. I'm working. Jesus said, with God... All things are possible. The Bible says in the book of Colossians that God holds the universe in his hand. If God holds the universe in his hand, which is true, and there's no doubt in my mind he does, then is anything really too difficult for God to do? Only what you believe will limit God. God still does so-called impossible. He is the same today, yesterday, and forever. Today you can believe God or that which seems impossible, if you will. He goes on, now he starts his testimony in verse 9. Indeed, I myself thought I must go to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. 
in the book of Matthew chapter 14, 24, it says this. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves from the wind was contrary. This word is used in both of these scriptures, having the same meaning. Paul's life before he knew Jesus was tossed just like the boat in the seas. And that is exactly how it is before any man or woman knows Jesus. Their lives are tossed all over the place without any direction and out of control. Now, if you are a Christian this morning, can you agree with this statement? Can you agree that your life was a mess? It had no direction. You were flipping like a fish out of the water. I can, I can attest to that personally. I see this today in so many who do not know God. Even if they are doing well by the world's standards, they live out of direction, whether it is their marriage, their children, their home, or their business. Love it. What is going on behind closed doors or what is going on behind closed hearts are revealed many times in time. It is not always what it seems on the outside. That's why when you hear of someone you know having marital problems, you may be shocked, but they're not. Now this rocking boat on the waves can also be in a Christian's life that God is allowing because he is working, but he calms the storms or he will make his presence known to them. Paul goes on, he's telling his testimony, verse 10. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints shut up in prison. <coughs> Having received authority from the chief priests, when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. So Paul was not a good man before he knew Jesus. Although he was a good religious man to say, and he probably thought he was a great man, being successful as he was, religiously. Now, most people today think they are good people. I met a lot of them. That isn't to say that some people do not do good things, because they do. But in every man and woman, most things are done out of a wrong heart. Their motive is wrong. This is hard to accept as a person that what I did was out of a selfish gain or self selfishness or to impress people. It is amazing how we can deceive ourselves into believing something that is totally wrong. Paul believed he was doing what exactly what God would want him to do. And it was exactly the opposite of what God wanted him to do. I can't tell you how many people think and have that same thought today, even some in churches. It says in the scripture that the heart is desperately wicked. My heart, my natural heart, your heart, the Bible says, is wicked. It's evil. I know you may think this morning, no, my heart, I have a good heart. I used to have a good heart. You know, I used to think that way before I became a Christian. And then as God began to reveal my heart to me, it's like, ugh, ugh, ugh. I never said, oh, that's good. And God didn't show my evil heart to condemn me or to make me feel bad about myself. He made me to, to, to dismiss my heart and say, that's a mess. Don't go by your heart. The world tells you, let your heart be your guide. Really? That's like having Charles Manson say, hey, I want to rule your life. Okay, what the heck? You might as well. Paul was totally deceived before becoming a spirit-led Christian. In his deception, he heard a lot of people, especially people of God, but he was deceived. Verse 11, 
And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme and being exceedingly enraged against them. I persecuted them even to foreign cities. I want to read a scripture to you with that same thought in mind. Paul persecuting, Paul having them blaspheme. Acts chapter 22, 15. As also the high priest bears me witness and all the council of the elders, for whom I also received letters to the brethren. And I went to Damascus to put in chains even those who were there in Jerusalem and to punish them. So he literally, Paul, and he acknowledges this, that he caused people to curse the name of Jesus. He caused these people to lose their faith, to deny Jesus Christ. What kind of man would do this? A man who doesn't know God. But I want to say this, God saved him. He became a Christian and became one of the greatest men in the New Testament. God used him in a mighty way. He sold out to God. But he recognized he needed God and he recognized he was a sinner. And if God can save Paul, if God can forgive Paul, he can forgive any man or any woman who calls upon the name of Jesus. Amen? It says here that he was enraged against them. In other words, he was an angry, angry man before his conversion. He had great rage showing that his relationship with God was not right, despite the diligent religious observance. So I want to talk about this just for a moment and we'll move on. Are you an angry person? There's a difference between anger and frustration. Anger is something that God says you need to deal with. And anger usually comes because of unforgiveness that we have toward another person or other persons. Every one of us <clears throat> have had things done wrong against us. Every one of us. And the Bible teaches that as we have been forgiven much, God says he wants us to forgive others. If a person decides, and unfortunately, a lot of people hold this. Things that have been hurt or hurt them growing up. And they still hold it 30 and 40 and 50 years later. And it damages them and damages their, their relationship with God and damages their relationship with people. If we give our hearts over to God, God is willing to help us to forgive. And it will not affect us anymore. Okay, let me give you a test. If you think of somebody that you've been angry at, think of somebody in your heart this morning. I could say my dad, because I've forgiven him. It doesn't bother me one bit. It, I know I have forgiven him, because I can, the anger's gone. The hurt is gone. But what about you this morning? If you think of a person that has hurt you or affected your life badly, and you think of that person, it affects you, and you get tense, and you... Don't tell me. I don't want to think... Or your, your thought is, I don't want to think about that person. Don't even try that, Pastor. You're getting me mad right now. I'm glad I'm getting you mad. Because now you're going to have to deal with it. Jesus makes this statement. If you will not forgive, guess what? You will not be forgiven. He says that so we will turn toward him and we will forgive. God wants you to be free. But freedom comes by obedience to the word of God. Now, Paul goes on, testimony, verse 12. While thus occupied as a journey, I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests. 
At midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me, and those who journeyed with me. And when we had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speak to me and say in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard to kick against the goads. Most of you probably know what a goad is, and most of you know what a kicking against it is. A goad was something that was made out of iron, usually. It was put on the back of, or the front of carts, so when the oxen would kick, it would hurt itself. It kicked back, and the gourd would go into his, his leg, and he would hurt himself. And God speaks to him, Jesus really speaks to him, and tells Paul, you're kicking against the goads, but you're only hurting yourself, Paul. Why are you doing this? In other words, God was working on him, and you're kicking against the work of God. There are many today who are doing this same thing concerning their lives. Christians and non-Christians. This can be done by resisting the will of God for our lives. For non-Christians, it is the will of God that you become born again, that you receive the gift of salvation through Jesus sent to you from God above. For the Christian, there are some who say to God, not my will but thine, I choose. And they willingly submit to God's will. God's word and the leading of the Holy Spirit. But there are some who think that they know better than God. So they'll kick against the goads and hurt themselves and others they love. Question this morning. Are you kicking against the goads by rejecting God's will for your life? It only hurts you. Those who do this are usually miserable, angry, unhappy, and always thirsty and searching for fulfillment in all the wrong places. It is always easier and better to just give in to the will of God instead of fighting against his blessing. Let me say this in concluding that part. I can honestly say before God and before you this morning that I know that everything that God does in my life is his perfect will doesn't mean I never fight against it or resist. That's not what I'm saying. If you know and you have the right concept of God, you have no problem when you know what God's will is and God's working that in you to not fight against him. The more you know God, the easier it is to say, okay, God, okay, God because you experience his love like nothing you've ever experienced before. You know his faithfulness and you know his motive is only to bless you and bless your life. That's how we have to look at it. Verse 15, so I said, who are you, Lord? And he said to him, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and witness both of these things which you have seen and the things which I will reveal to you. So Jesus speaks to Paul, and he tells him, I have a calling and a purpose for your life, Paul. Now God calls us and has a purpose for our life. When you thumb through the Bible in the New Testament, and you go about to the fifth and sixth chapter, I'm sorry, book, and you go into Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, you go into Ephesians, you go into Philippians, you go into Thessalonians. Guess who wrote all those books? Paul. This was God's purpose for Paul's life. And Paul went and pro proclaimed the gospel and was a witness of what God had done. 
But not only what God had done then, but what God would do in the future. I emphasize that because God has a plan for your life. And it's a good plan. He has a plan for today. He has a plan for the future in the sense of what he's going to show you and do in you and reveal to you. But it's up to you what you do with it. God is that personal. And Paul goes on with his testimony in chapter 26, verse 17. I will deliver you to you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I will now send you to open up their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sin as an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in him. So Paul will be delivered by God from the Jewish people, and God does, and the Gentiles for a reason. And they are mentioned in these next four things. The first one is, to whom I will send you to open up the eyes, or their eyes. Before we became Christians, there was spiritual blindness on all of us. The unbeliever doesn't have a clue about real spiritual things. I've been witnessing to this man. He's 38 years old. And he's almost, he's just about there. He's, he's fighting against what God is trying to do. He's kicking against the goads. God's really allowing certain things to happen to make him miserable. But his eyes are closed. He's blind. I try to explain certain things in the scripture, and he looks at me like, huh? Paul was sent by God to open up the eyes of those who were spiritually blinded that needed to be opened. They could not see who the Lord was. So God sent Paul to reveal this truth to them. Some of them received the truth about Jesus and their eyes were open and others would reject him. I want to read a scripture to you. This is true about every single person who does not know Christ. It's in the book of 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, and it says this. If the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil... It is hidden only from people who are perishing. Satan, who is the god of this world, has blinded the mind of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand the message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. And this is what Paul would be used to do by God. And this is what we're supposed to be used by God to do. Let's look at the second one. To turn them from darkness to light. Let me read this word to you in the original Greek. Darkness. Ignorance, respecting divine things, and the human duties, and the accompanying of ungodliness and immorality, together with the consequence of misery and hell. Persons in whom darkness becomes visible and holds sway. Beloved, following Jesus is a life of walking in purity and a life of walking away from darkness of sin. This is so evident if we will just take a second look at the ways, the paths, and many of those in the world today. They think the things that they are doing are okay and are even normal. Some of the things that the people call normal is like a mind blower. Ten years ago, they would call you crazy. And 30 years ago, they would call you, they would say you have mental illness now. And what people are saying is totally normal. To turn them to light, to the power of understanding a moral, spiritual truth. Three, to turn them to the power, from the power of Satan to God. 
Before following Jesus, a person is a slave to Satan. What's worse is that many don't even have a clue about it. There are two kingdoms, and this is by Pastor Chuck. He wrote this, there are two kingdoms in the world to date. Two spheres of government, the government of God and the government of Satan. They are mutually exclusive and antagonistic. Every man exists in one of these two kingdoms. You today are living in the kingdom of light or the kingdom of darkness. You're living under the control of Satan or under the control of God. There are only two governing spheres of the universe. In the beginning, there was just one, the kingdom of God. All things in obedience and in subjection unto him. God created angelic beings, one special being known as Lucifer, the anointed cherub, rebelled against the authority of God and formed a second government, the government of death and darkness. Ultimately, Satan's kingdom is going to come, to, come down. In fact, it is close to the end of Satan's reign now. Let me read a scripture to you, Hebrews 2.14. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. The fourth turn that Paul was supposed to be a witness to was to bring and receive forgiveness. At the heart of understanding Christianity is to understand God's offer to freely forgive us all, all of our sins. If we choose to accept Jesus' death on the cross as a payment for our sins, that's important. Now, this is a life in India. Let me read it to you. As a married couple, they enter into life with very little. They work every day just to survive. But once they have children, many cannot make it. So what they do is they will take a loan from a rock quarry just to feed their children. What they don't understand is that the interest is so great that they can never pay it back in their lifetime. So what happens is as the debt increases, other family members must work at the quarry. The wife is the next one to work there. Then comes the oldest child. You could have four children, some even at the age of four, and they could be working at the quarry all day just like their parents. The sad part of the debt continues to grow, especially if the parents get sick or can't work for a while. Then something even worse, the debt will be passed down to their children. So they continue to have to pay their parents' debt, and it can keep going on and on to the next gen generation. This can be how sin works, but God's heart is always ready to forgive all today. And it says here to receive forgiveness. How many of you know that the President of the United States can pardon any person at any time in their life. As long as he is in the office, he can totally give them a pardon. How many knew that? Raise your hand. Yes, some of you did. A few years back, there was a man named, his last name was Wilson. He was pardoned by the president. But he decided he was not going to receive that pardon. He said, I don't want it. So they couldn't decide what they could do with it because the president pardoned him. So they took it to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said, if he doesn't want to receive the pardon, then he has to be executed. So they hung him. Now I tell that story because I think it's important. It's important that this man, Wilson, just like any person alive, has a choice to receive the gospel and forgiveness by God through Jesus Christ and Christ alone, or they can reject it. 
It's a sad thing when you come to a place, as we will see in a moment, of where God begins to work, that person comes to the door, and they reject salvation. God is in the business of forgiving. Verse 19, Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but I declared first to those in Damascus and Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles, and they should repent and turn to God and do works fitting for, for repentance. So Paul was calling upon the people, even as John the Baptist did, and even as Jesus did, to change and to turn, turn from a life of dominated by the flesh to the life of dominated by the Spirit. I want you to notice that the actions will confirm true repentance. Verse 21, For these reasons the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me, therefore having obtained help from God. To this day I stand the witnesses both to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophet of Moses said would come, that Christ would suffer and that he would be the first to rise from the dead and would proclaim the light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Now, as he thus made his defense, Festus with his loud voice said, Paul, are you beside yourself? In other words, are you cuckoo? Much learning is driving you mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but I speak the words of truth and reason. For the king before whom I also speak freely knows these things. I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention, since these things was not done in the corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe them. And Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. I'll tell you right now, I'll bet you right now where he's at, he's not in heaven. King Agrippa, but I bet you he would have made a decision differently when Paul presented this to him. Verse 29, and Paul said, I would go to God that not only you, but all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. When he had said these things, the king stood up as well as the governor and Bernice and those who sat with them. And when they had gone aside, they talked among themselves, saying, This man is doing nothing deserving of death. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. I think how tragedy of Agrippa so close. The tragedy of many today so close. You see a person who comes very close to the kingdom, almost persuaded, but just somehow they don't take the final step. And you think, oh, how tragic it is to close eternal life, to close to God's kingdom, so f close to freedom from sin. I oh, would to God I was not just almost, but altogether persuaded. Now, I want to go back for a second, and then I'm done. And I want to read the scripture to you, because I think it's important. Jeremiah 6:16 6, again. Thus says the Lord, stand in the way and see the and ask for the old path, where the good way is, and walk in it. Then you'll find rest for your souls. But they said to him, we will not walk in it. I want to emphasize that you'll find rest for your souls. The Bible teaches us that God wants us to walk in the old path. How are you doing with that, beloved? Are you walking according to the scripture, according to the word of God? That's the old path. God desires that. And God makes a promise, as you do that, then you'll find peace and rest for your souls. If you need rest and peace, then you need to say to God, is there something I'm not walking in the old path? I need to get back on there, God. Father, we are grateful for the word of God, and we thank you, Lord, 
that that's where we find truth. And when we find, Lord, the freedom, Lord, but we know the truth sets us free. Father, we pray, Lord God, for each heart this morning, Lord. We pray, Lord God, that we would walk close to you, Lord, not because we have to, but because we love you, Lord God. May love be the motivator, Lord. We pray, Lord God, that if you're working anything in our hearts this morning, that we would yield and surrender over to you and we say, yes, Lord, whatever you want, God, we want. For Father, you only do a good work in your people, Lord. And we pray, Lord God, that each heart would believe you, God, that you are able to accomplish anything, Lord. There's nothing you can't do. There's nothing, Father, that holds your hand from doing, Father, what you desire and what your word says. So, Father, may we believe you. May our faith be stronger in you than ever before, Lord God. And, Lord, I ask that you would fill each one this morning with your Holy Spirit, God. Thank you, Lord, for forgiveness, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Let us stand this morning. We have a 10-minute break. There's stuff in the back that's going to be there for you to eat. Um, different kind of crackers and stuff like that. So if you need to eat something, please do. Please don't bring it back in the sanctuary. If you need prayer, we'll have pastors up here. We'll have pastors come up, please. We'd love to pray for you if you need prayer. If you want to come up to the altar and pray or talk to the Lord in some way or another as our worship team plays, please do. So in 10 more minutes, we'll be back in here, okay? God bless you. Have a safe day. No more snowmen.